Hello everyone, very good evening. Welcome to AS for CS classes. Myself CS Arun Maripalli from Hyderabad. So before I start up, let me thank ICSI uh, because lots of queries and problems was faced by the students with respect to the new topics that has been added up. They certainly they did uh, they understood the problems too. So we have got a clarification that whatever the new topics that has been added up by the recent uh, inclusions that will be applicable from the June 2021 uh, attempt. So whatever the normal amendments that have come from Jan to June uh, 2020, so only those amendments will be applicable for the December attempt. So no new more topics that has been added for the December attempt. Clear everyone, not only the subject, whatever the new models, that is, uh, whatever the new topics that has been added up for all the subjects, whatever the subject it may be, that will be only applicable from the June to 20, 2021 attempt. Clear? So now, the agenda for this particular session will be understanding the amendments what we have got with respect to the Ghanan subject that is both of uh, company site and the SEBI regulations uh, from January 2020 to June 2020 which will be applicable for the December attempt. Clear everyone? First of all we will be discussing about the company site uh, amendments then we will go to the SEBI regulations and the new some new topics that is being added up for the December attempt so that topics will be discussing. Clear everyone? Now. The first one, the under the company act. So let us understand, let us follow the same procedure. We'll understand the concept, then we'll move to the PDF part. Clear? Now, two amendments have come with respect to the independent directors. One, as we already discussed, so the independent directors and the non executive directors will be liable only if at all whatever the default made by the company if such default is made with the knowledge of that independent directors or the non-executive directors that means if at all any company makes any default of any of the provisions or they make any non-compliance of any particular provision of the act whatever the act it may be generally the officers in default will also be made liable and for that officers in default the independent directors and the non-executive directors shall not be for the non-executive directors it shall not be relating to the promoter the promoter so who is an independent of the promoter group that is a non-executive director and an independent director they will not be made liable for the non-compliance or the defaults made by the company and they will not be held for any prosecutions unless whatever the default or the non-compliance that has been made if at all such things are made with the knowledge of such person be it an independent or the non-executive then they shall be made liable clear everyone now see what it says the general circular number 1 by 2020 clarification on prosecutions filed or internal adjudication proceedings initiated against the independent directors or non-promoters and non-KMP non-exit directors non-promoters is what they are using so they are not relating to the promoter group nor the KMP and they are the non-exit directors it is dated 2nd March 2020 this circular clearly shows that ministry resolve and intend to give a protection to whom to the independent directors and the other non-executive directors other non-executive directors from what from the prosecution for both civil and criminal offenses unless very important line unless there is a strong evidence against them that they being a party to any fraud committed by the company that means unless you have such an evidence a strong evidence so that you could prove that these non exit directors or the independent directors are involved in that particular non compliance or the fraud made by the company only then these two category of directors will be made liable or any prosecutions may be initiated against such particular independent directors or the non exit directors who are not relating to the promoters or a KMP I repeat say for example if I being a promoter of a company if I being a promoter of a company where I being an MD say for example my brother Mr. B is a non-executive director my brother Mr. B is a non-executive director on the board of that listed company or whatever the company now the company have made a default or the company have made some fraud the question is whether Mr. B will be held liable for that or not what are professions what are provisions say sorry sir the exemption is being provided only to the independent directors and 
to the non executive directors to the non executive directors but the provision for that is that non executive directors shall not be related to the promoters or a kmp now mr b being a non executive director but he is related to the promoter group he is relating to the he is related to the promoter group then you cannot take the shelter of this particular clarification that means two important things first of all you shall be a non executive director and you shall not be related to the promoter or a kmp of that company then if if such is a case then such independent director and such non executive director who is not a prom, who is not a promoter it is not related to the promoter or promoter group or to the kmp then those people will not be held liable unless you have a strong evidence that they are involved in such fraud clear everyone i repeat once again it gives a protection to the independent directors and other non executive directors from prosecution for both civil and criminal offences unless there is a strong evidence unless there is a strong evidence against them that being a party to any fraud committed by the company sir you have a particular evidence that sir they are involved in this particular fraud only then these independent directors and the non executive directors shall be made liable and can be prosecuted section 149 sub section 12 of the companies act 2013 is abstent clause which provides an independent director and a non executive director not being a promoter or a kmp shall be held liable only in respect of such acts of omission or a commission by a company which had occurred with his knowledge very important with his knowledge attributable through a board process and with his consent or connivance or where he, where he had acted he had not acted diligently so three important things he is saying there what is that sir these independent directors and such non executive directors who are not a promoter or a kmp not related to the promoter or a kmp they will be held liable when if at all whatever the acts of omission or a commission made by the company such omissions or commission that is a frauds or some non compliance made by made on part of a company is made with the knowledge of that particular director with the knowledge of that directors here directors means your independent directors and the non executive directors so with the knowledge of that particular directors or attributable to the through the board process you are involved in that particular board you knew that these company is making some fraud still you haven't made or you haven't given any alarm that sir this is going beyond the law and with his consent you are aware of that particular non compliance you are aware of that particular fraud i even have given a consent for that particular fraud and you have an evidence for that then you could be prosecuted or the last one connivance or where he had not acted diligently then only in such case only in such case these independent directors and the non executive directors who are not related to the promoter or a kmp they will be held liable so in a nutshell generally whatever the fraud that made by the company the independent directors and the non executive directors shall not be held liable non executive directors uh, you have to mean that they are not relating to the promoter or a kmp so in general rule is that these directors will not be held liable and they, they cannot be made subject to the prosecution but if at all such fraud is been made with the knowledge of such directors with the consent of the directors with the connivance of that particular directors then you may be prosecuted you may be held liable for that clear everyone and you possess a strong evidence that is alleging party or the authorities possess a strong evidence to prove that you are involved in this particular fraud then the independent directors nor the uh, and the non executive directors cannot take a shelter that sir we are not liable for that particular acts or activities done by the company clear everyone and in view of this expressed provision of section 149 sub section 12 of the companies act independent directors and the non executive directors not being a promoter or a kmp should not be arrayed in any criminal or civil proceedings under the act unless the above mentioned criteria is met that means sir the independent directors and the non executive directors shall not be made liable shall not be made liable for be it a civil proceedings or a criminal proceedings unless the clauses what we have seen here 
so this is about your with your knowledge or with your consent or with the convenience or you didn't act diligently if such criteria is met then you may be drawn for the prosecution so otherwise you will not be held held liable for any of the liabilities clear everyone then mc has clarified that at the time of serving notice to the company during inquiry inspection investigation or adjudication proceedings etc necessary documents may be sought so as to ascertain the involvement of concerned officers of the companies and due care must be taken to ensure that unnecessarily any civil or criminal proceedings is not initiated against the independent directors or non executive directors unless sufficient evidence exists against them sir whenever these authorities comes to know that the company have made certain fraud and these authorities are issuing any notice for any inquiry or a further investigation to the directors of the company to the directors of the company the authorities shall take care that these in, these notices are not been sent to these independent directors or unnecessarily you shall not take any actions against such independent directors and the non executive directors unless you possess a strong evidence that yes these directors are involved in this particular offense clear everyone so what it says ensure that no unnecessarily sorry at that unnecessarily any civil or criminal proceedings is not initiated against the independent directors or non executive directors unless when when you have a sufficient against uh, evidence against them so if at all you have a sufficient evidence so that you could prove that they are involved in this particular fraud then you issue notice to this independent directors and the non executive directors and they may be prosecuted clear everyone so the records available in the office of registrar including the e forms dr11 and dr12 along with the copies of annual returns or the financial statements should also be examined so as to ascertain whether a particular director or a kmp was serving in the company as on date of default so as on date of default you need to ascertain as to who are the officers in default so certain documents which are available with the registrar the authorities may look into so as to ascertain who are the officers in default for that offence committed by the company in case any doubt with regard to the liability of any person for any proceedings required to be initiated by the registrar guidance may be sought from the minister of corporate affairs through the office of director general of corporate affairs so in order to proceed further with respect to this type of investigations where if the registrar requires any sort of information then the mca ministry provides a guidance with regard to such investigations clear everyone this is what the amendment with respect to the prosecutions on part of the independent directors and the non executive directors so in nutshell the exemption is been provided to the independent directors and to the non executive directors to the non executive directors but they shall not be relating to the promoter or a kmp then against these two individuals against these two directors no prosecutions can be initiated unless you could prove that they are involved in that particular fraud clear everyone you have a sufficient evidence to prove they are involved in that particular fraud clear everyone this is the first amendment and you could see this chapter uh, this concepts in your uh, chapter 2 and chapter 3 chapter 2 and chapter 3 clear everyone clear can we move ahead then one more concept with respect to independent directors now there is a particular website which has been developed so as to maintain the independent directors data bank data bank whereby if a person is already been appointed as an independent director in any existing company or if any person who intends to be appointed or who intends to act as an independent director in any other in any company on a future date shall compulsory register himself with this independent directors data bank a particular website is been provided where you provide all your basic details in that particular data bank you register there 
you pay that prescribed fees that is of 5000 odd for one year and you have a lifetime fees too that is of 25000 so you register yourself in that particular website and pay that particular fee and also you need to write a particular examination and you have to pass that particular examination only then you will be you will be having a right you qualify and you will be eligible to act as an independent director of the companies I repeat who have been already been appointed as an independent director of a company or who intends to be appointed as an independent director of any company shall compulsory register himself with the independent director's data bank by paying a prescribed fee and also not only the registration registration plus the examination so passing of examination you have a particular syllabus for these for these independent directors so you need to pass out that independent director's examination only then you will be qualified to act as an independent director's the company clear everyone now look into that mcfi notification number 145 the by virtue of the company's appointment and qualification of director's amendment rules 2020 dated 20th february 2020 so what it says compliance is required by a person eligible very important eligible and willing to be appointed as what as an independent director what is that every individual first part who has been appointed as an independent director in a company so first part you already been independent director you're acting as an independent director in the existing board of a company i repeat sir i'm already an independent director of the company i'm already an independent director of the company then on the date of commencement of the company's appointment and qualification of directors fifth amendment rules 2019 so as on today as on that particular date if i am if i am an independent director of a company then he shall i myself within a period of 10 months from the commencement of this particular rules within 10 months from the commencement of this particular rules or two who intends to get appointed who intends to get appointed the first one was he was already an independent director in a company as on date of this particular rule the second one is not at appointed but after the date of these rules he may be appointed on a future date he intends to get appointed as an independent director then who intends to get appointed as an independent director in a company after such commencement after such commencement shall before such appointment shall before such appointment that means sir the first part was within 10 months from the commencement of this particular rules if at all you already been an independent director in an existing company you register yourself you register yourself with the website second one as on date of commencement of these rules you are not acting as an independent director i repeat once again clear everyone sir as on date of commencement of these rules you are no more you are not an independent director but after the commencement of rules you intend to be appointed as an independent director of a company you intend to be appointed as an independent director of the company but what is the qualification for that apart from the uh, eligibility criteria that you have as per 149 first of all you have to register yourself before your appointment it is not after the appointment the law is very much clear it says shall before such appointment so before you get before you are being appointed into the company on the board of the company you apply online apply online to the institute to the institute for the inclusion of his name in the data bank so you apply to that particular web through that particular website for inclusion of your name in that particular independent director independent directors data bank for a period of one year or five years or for lifetime so you have three over three things here one for one year or for five years or for lifetime for lifetime so you have specific fees for each and every slab rate over there for one year it is 5000 for five years it is somewhere around 15 and for lifetime it is somewhere around 25000 odd plus gst so you apply for inclusion of your name to that particular data bank for a period of one or five years or for lifetime and from time to time take such steps as specified in rule 62 of the appoint company's appointment and qualification of directors rules 2015 
टिल ही कंटिन्यूज टू होल्ड द ऑफिस ऑफ एन इंडिपेंडेंट डायरेक्टर इन एनी कंपनी दैट मींस सर इट इज नॉट वन टाइम सो टुडे इफ एट ऑल आई एम इंटेंडिंग टू बी अपॉइंटेड एज एन इंडिपेंडेंट डायरेक्टर आई रजिस्टर्ड माई सेल्फ इन दैट पर्टिकुलर डेटा बैंक फॉर वन ईयर बट आफ्टर वन ईयर ऑल्सो आई एम कंटिन्यूंग एज एन इंडिपेंडेंट डायरेक्टर देन इट इज नॉट द क्राइटेरिया सो सर टिल यू कंटिन्यू टू बी एन इंडिपेंडेंट डायरेक्टर ऑफ अ कंपनी टिल यू कंटिन्यू टू बी एन इंडिपेंडेंट डायरेक्टर ऑफ अ कंपनी दिस क्वालिफिकेशन शेल बी मेट दिस कंप्लायस शेल बी मेट इट मीन्स यार नेम हैज टू बी देर इन यर इंडिपेंडेंट डायरेक्टर्स डेटा बैंक सो वन दिस वन ईयर इज बीन डन यू टू अप्लाई फॉर द रेन्यूअल आर बाई पेमेंट ऑफ द प्रिस्क्राइब फी क्लियर एवरी वन सो two two things over there one i am already acting as an independent director two i am not an independent director as on date of the commencement the first case if at all i am already an independent director then within 10 months i shall apply online to that particular website that is independent directors data bank where i have to include my name in that particular data bank within 10 months the second one if i am not an independent director as on date of the commencement but i intend to be <coughs> I'm sorry. I intend to be appointed as an independent director of a company. Then, before you get appointed, before you get appointed, you register yourself. You apply through online to the data bank for inclusion of your name. Only then, your appointment will be valid. Clear, everyone. For whatever the period is, one year or five years or for a lifetime, by paying the prescribed fee. You include your name in that data bank. Then only you can be appointed as an independent director. Clear, everyone. This is a prerequisite for the appointment of independent director, my dear friends. Very important one. Expected question for the December attempt. This is a prerequisite for a particular director to be appointed as an independent director of a company. Then, an individual shall not be required to pass the online proficiency self assessment test. Yes. now apart from this registration in this particular data bank that is first one second one you need to pass apart besides with respect to registration in the data bank you need to pass an online proficiency test so that you could be appointed as an independent director sir why come this independent directors examination sir sir independent directors of a listed company they are you know there there is there is some expected role and responsibility on part of this independent directors they need to check on the company as to progress of the company and also with respect to the financials and non financial terms where there is expected from the on part of independent directors that they possess certain quality and the qualifications they possess some particular knowledge on that particular field they should have a knowledge on the corporate laws so in order to maintain that in order to escalate the board structure the proficiency of that particular board of a listed companies whereby the ministry of corporate affairs have come up that sir whoever intends to be get appointed as an independent directors of a company be it a public or a listed company first of all you should get register yourself with this data bank two you please write an examination the self assessment proficiency test and pass in that you have a criteria so you pass that only then you can be appointed you are eligible to be appointed as an independent director of a company clear everyone it is not one way two way one you register yourself to write the examination pass then you can be appointed as an independent director in a list, in a company if at all you don't pass then you'll not be eligible you'll not be eligible but certain exemptions have been provided with respect to the writing of examinations for the category of directors who are, who are those look into this an individual shall not be required to pass the online proficiency self assessment test which sorry when he has served as a director or a kmp is as a director or a kmp for a total period of not less than 10 years as on date of inclusion of his name as on the date of inclusion of his name in the data bank so say for example today i am registering myself in this data bank then if at all i am serving as a director or a kmp for not less than 10 years there is minimum of 10 years i have been serving as a director or a kmp as on today's date in when in which companies in a listed public company 
in a listed public company or unlisted public company having a paid up share capital of 10 crores or more or a body corporate listed on a recognized stock exchange recognized stock exchange so a listed public company unlisted public company having a paid up capital of 10 crores or more or a body corporate listed on a recognized stock exchange then that means on the board of these three if at all you are serving as a director or a KMP for a minimum of 10 years then you have to register but you do not write the examination sir the, ex the exemption is provided only with respect to the online examination but not with respect to registration very very important sir the exemption that has been provided over here is only with respect to passing of examination criteria but not with respect to registration of the directorship that is uh, inclusion of name in the data bank in the data bank clear everyone provided look into the provision there provided further that for the purpose of calculation of the period of 10 years referred to in the first proviso any period during which an individual was acting as a director or as a KMP uh, that is key manager personnel in two or more companies or body corporates at the same time shall be counted only once very important look into that where an individual was acting an individual was acting as a director or as a KMP in two or more companies or a body corporate or a body corporate at the same time shall be counted only once that means sir I am serving as a director in one com one listed company for five years and I have been serving as a KMP in another company from the last six years then I cannot combine those two six plus five clear everyone so that will turn into only one so what it says which an individual was acting as a director or a KMP in two or more companies in two or more companies then that is at the same time then it shall be counted only once clear everyone the C is with respect to inclusion sorry appointment of independent directors with respect to data bank so in a nutshell sir as on date of this particular rule you already been acting as an independent director of a company then within 10 months register yourself with this data bank two if at all you are not acting as an independent director as on date but after the commencement of these rules on any future date if you intends to get as uh, intends to get appointed as an independent director of a company then before such appointment you apply yourself for the inclusion of your name in the data bank and also pass the examination there is passing of exam is both for both the case either you are existing independent director or intended to be getting appointed as an independent director but an exemption has been provided to certain category of directors who are those where any individual who has been serving as a director or a KMP for not less than 10 years in a listed company, listed public company or unlisted public company of a paid up capital of 10 crores or more or a body corporate listed on a recognized stock exchange then you do not write, you do not pass in examination but registration is mandatory clear everyone this is with respect to the inclusion of name and the registration of the name in the independent directors data bank clear everyone if at all time permits you go to that particular website and have a look into that website as to how this registration process is being done clear everyone can we move forward yes very important provision the company's appointment and remuneration of managerial personal rules to the amendment rules 2020 dated 3rd January 2020 where the appointment of company secretary with respect to the private limited companies the limits have been increased from 5 crores to 10 crore rule 8a have been amended where it says that every private company says every private company which is having a paid up share capital of 10 crores or more 10 crores or more shall have a whole time company secretary earlier it was 5 crores now it has been made to 10 crore clear everyone so what will be the impact for that with this amendment in rule 8a 
of the company's appointment and remuneration of managerial rules 2014 mcs clarified that every private company which is having a paid capital of 10 crores or more need to appoint a whole time company secretary clear everyone then the next amendment mcs amended rule 9 of the same rules appointment and remuneration of kmp managerial personal rules 2014 with respect to yes secretarial audit report secretarial audit report so now every company having expected question for examination now every company having outstanding loans or borrowings from the banks or the public financial institutions of 100 crores or more is also required to annex the secretarial audit report with its board report so it's say it's stating every company be it a private limited company or a public limited company every company it is so mc has also clarified that for the purpose of this rule paid up share capital turnover or outstanding loans or borrowings as the case may be existing at on the last date of latest audited financial statement shall be taken into account so post amendment the rule looks like this the following companies are required to obtain a secretarial audit report so every listed company public company having a paid up capital of 50 crores or more public company having a turnover of 250 crores or more and this is amendment every company so be it a private company or a public company if at all they are having outstanding loans or borrowings from the banks or a public financial institutions from banks or financial institutions of 100 crores or more then such class of companies shall obtain a secretary audit report from a practicing company secretary i annex that to the board report clear everyone and you'll be having that impact these two provisions inclusions in your chapter number 3 and chapter number 6 clear everyone yes moving ahead to the csr amendments so to the schedule 7 some new additions have been made with respect to send spending of these csr amounts so due to this covid 19 pandemic so in order to curb this and to save the citizens whereby the ministry have included that wherever wherever the corporates were spending with respect to the covid prevention of this particular covid where they are uh, serving to the needy people they have included that particular spending of amounts as a csr activity as a csr activity so whatever the funds that you spend towards the covid 19 related matters that will be an eligible amount towards the csr as per section 135 clear everyone so spending of csr funds shall uh, sorry spending of funds for the covid covid 19 shall qualify as a csr amount second one whatever the amount that uh, sorry the donations that you make to the pm cares fund to the pm cares fund it will also be eligible as a csr spent amount csr activity clear again due to this covid 19 this pm cares fund have come up and lots of corporates have donated some crores of amount for the well being of the india of india clear everyone and the last one amount spent in relation to measures for the benefit of central armed police forces capf and central paramilitary forces cpmf veterans and their dependents including widows so for their benefit for their benefit whatever the amount that you spend in relation to that benefit that will qualify as a csr amount csr activity clear everyone so these are some specific amendments with respect to csr that is applicable for the december attempt apart from these there are some other amendments have come in csr but to the academical point of view that will not be applicable for the december attempt because that was after june uh, 2020 the amendments have come so that will be applicable for the june 2021 that will be discussed in a separate session clear everyone so with respect to csr amendments these three are the new inclusions new inclusions which has been made to schedule 7 and which is uh, which will be applicable for the coming attempt december 2020 clear one is with respect to covid 19 funds next pm cares and capf and cpmf is what the 
new inclusion which is being made to schedule 7 clear everyone so that sums up yeah companies act amendments that is uh, that has come from jan to june 2020 which is applicable for the december attempt clear everyone so what we have seen one is with respect to uh, two th two things with respect to independent directors one on part of uh, the prosecutions of independent directors and the non exit directors who are not a promoter or a kmp where they will not be held liable for that unless you have a strong evidence two inclusion of name in the independent directors data bank to be appointed as an independent director of a company we have gave, we have given some time limits over there by paying a prescribed fee and the examination passing of examination that is online self proficiency test self assessment test a person can be appointed as an independent director of a company then you have seen amendment with respect to appointment of a company secretary with respect to a private limited company where the amounts have been increased this a paid up capital has been increased from 5 crore to 10 crore rule 8a amendment and rule 9 has been amended with respect to secretarial audit report where a new provision has been added up that is with respect to every company be it a private or a public company earlier we had only listed company and public company paid up and turnover 50 and 250 crores respectively but now one more thing is been added up that is every company be it a pay, uh, public or a private company where outstanding loans or borrowings from banks or a public financial institutions is 100 crores or more as per the latest audited balance sheet then such company shall obtain the secretary audit report in mr3 from the practicing company secretary and annex that to the board report clear and the last one is about your csr amendments that is covid 19 pm cares then CAPF and CPMF, the donations what you make will be eligible towards the CSR activities. Clear everyone, these are the Companies Act amendments. Clear? Can we move ahead? Yes. So now coming to the SEBI LODR regulations. So now, Regulation 17.1b of LODR regulation, this is dealing with respect to separation of role. Separation of role of chairperson. So, if at all you remember, we have we have discussed we had discussed this concept in our regular comprehensive batches, where we said that there was a separation of role of a chairperson, where earlier the provision was with respect to April one two thousand twenty. So, with if from April one two thousand twenty, there was a separation of role of a chairperson of a listed company, but that has been extended further uh, to 2022 whereby from april 1 2022 the top 500 listed companies shall comply this particular provision what is that the top 500 listed companies that is listed entities shall ensure that the chairperson of the board the chairperson of the board of such listed entity shall be a non-executive director shall be a non-executive director that means the executive director cannot act as a chairperson of the listed company that is top 500 listed companies an executive, dire executive director cannot be appointed as a chairperson he shall be a non-executive director and one more thing and he shall not be related to the managing director or a chief executive officer as per the definition of the term relative defined under the company act so two fold it is one you shall be a non-executive director two you shall not be relating to the managing director and the ceo of the company then you can be appointed as a chairperson of the listed company sir you need to check out first of all you are executive director or non-executive director if at all executive directors then ruled out you cannot act as a chairperson of the listed company that is top 500 listed companies from 2022 april 1 but if at all you are a non-executive director you are a non-executive director then you need to check out whether you are related to the managing director or ceo of the company of the listed company if at all you are relating to this managing director or the ceo of the company then you cannot be appointed as a chairperson if at all you are not relating to the managing director or a CEO of the company, not related 
then you can be appointed as a chairperson of that listed company clear everyone so what it says with effect from april 1 2022 the top 500 listed companies the top 500 listed companies listed entities shall ensure that the chairperson of the board of such listed entity shall be a non executive director and he shall not be related to the managing director or a ceo or ceo so it is or it is not and or ceo as per the definition of the term relative under the companies act provided this regulation shall not be applicable to the listed entities which do not have any identifiable promoters as per the shareholding pattern filed with the stock exchanges so if at all your listed company is not having any identifiable promoters as per the latest shareholding pattern which is been filed with the stock exchanges then this provision will not be applicable clear everyone this is regulation 171b the amendment have come with respect to separation of role so the amendment here is with respect to instead of 2022 sorry instead of 2020 it has been amended now to 2022 clear everyone then very important standard operating procedure for suspension and revocation of trading of specified securities so very important in 2020 january the sebi have come up with this sop standard operating procedure whereby they have come up with a uniform penalties to listed companies for whatever the non compliance that they make with respect to the sebi regulations further with respect to freezing of demat accounts of the promoters and the promoters group group if at all there was a non compliance on part of the listed companies and further suspension of trading of the securities of that listed companies if at all you are, you are not complying with so and so provisions what has been provided in the annexures whereby they intend to promote that this listed company shall always try to ensure the compliances the corporate governance standards on part of that listed company is because keeping at the interest of stakeholders where you need to comply with each and every provision not only the procedural compliances even the regulatory compliance also be to be complied on part of the listed companies whereby the hefty penalties have been imposed if at all there is any non compliance on part of the company further extending that to the freezing of demat accounts of the promoters and the promoters group of that listed company as per the recently filed shareholding pattern the stock exchanges and also dealing with suspension of trading of that listed companies so we have got some uh, regulations whereby some non compliance is there they have provided 1000 5000 10000 per day penalties whereby they have uniformed all the penalties for the listed companies for certain provisions clear everyone so non compliance with the certain provisions of sebi elvodia regulations 2015 and the standard operating procedure for suspension of suspension and revocation of trading of specified securities this is what the sebi has come up where it says that sebi has issued a circular specifying the uniform structure very important uniform structure for imposing the fines as a first resort this is a first resort for non compliance with the certain provisions of the listing regulations freezing of entire shareholding of the promoter and the promoter group and the standard operating procedure for suspension of trading in case the non compliance is a continuing on or or repetitive the stock exchange shall have shall with having regard to the interest of investors we said this interest of investors in the securities market take action in case of an non compliance with the listing regulations and follow the standard operating procedure for suspension and revocation of suspension of trading of specified securities sir as a first resort they are going to impose a penalty and also going to freeze the demat accounts of the promoters and the promoters group of that listed company and if you still the listed company is making a non compliance maybe for a continuous two quarters say for example for example if at all they have not complied with respect to appointment of a women director for continuous two quarters then that qualifies 
for a suspension of trading where you will be categorized as z category of listed company so there are certain categories that has been provided there are certain regulations wherein if at all you don't comply with that particular regulations then depending upon that particular regulation your security your uh, it's uh, the uh, penalties may be imposed on you severe fines will be imposed on you or or there may be a freeze of demat accounts of the promoter or the promoter group of the listed company as per the recently filed shareholding pattern because in that shareholding pattern you are going to provide who are the promoter and the promoters group and further if it is a continuous one or a repetitive in nature then your securities may be suspended your securities may be suspended clear everyone henceforth the stock exchanges shall having regard to the interest of investors and the securities market because at the end of the day you have pulled the amount of public and you are not going in the right direction there shall be some control where you are put in a right direction maybe by imposing hefty penalties on you where you may be complying with certain provisions where you don't repeat such kind of non compliances again and keeping in the interest of securities market the long survival of the securities market the sebi have come up with such operating procedure where take action in case of a non compliance of non compliance of the listing regulations as specified in the annex 1 where they are provided in regulations right regulation 7 regulation 6 company secretary regulation 6 17 8 19 20 24 so likewise so the regulations have been provided where if you don't comply with that particular regulations so then penalty is going to be imposed that may be ranging from 1000 2000 5000 10000 likewise per day so then penalties may be imposed it is as per annex 1 is concerned annex 2 is more of a severe in nature following the standard operating procedure sop for suspension and revocation of suspension it may suspend where it may give a directions to you to comply with that if you comply then they may revoke the suspension revocation of suspension of what trading of specified securities as specified in annex 2 of the sebi circular number so and so dated january 22 2020 stock exchange may deviate from the above if found necessary only after recording the reasons in writing clear everyone so if at all your offense is a continuous one or a repetitive one then your shares may be suspended clear everyone and even the promoters and promoters group share demats may be freezed wherein you cannot deal in the shares of the companies clear everyone this is the sop that is been included in the, the chapter number 10 clear everyone so two important things that is regulation 17 with respect to separation of role of a chairperson and the another thing that is standard operating procedure clear everyone this is as far as your uh, sebi regulations are concerned then new topics that has been added up uh, not new topics actually uh, again the same amendments with respect to certain codes certain principles provided by different uh, authorities clear now first one new 2020 uk stewardship code stewardship code we have studied this stewardship code already in the chapter number 1 if at all you remember and uh, that has been revised once again and the new regulations new principles not a regulation new guidelines and the principles have been provided in 2000 2020 they have revised existing guidelines existing principles and they have come up with a revised 2020 principles with regard to the stewardship clear everyone so what it says stewardship is a responsible allocation management and oversight of capital to create a long term value for the clients and the beneficiaries leading to sustainable benefits for the economy then to the environment and ultimately to the society sir what is this stewardship first of all we have understood this but what do you mean by this stewardship so you are managing you are managing the assets of different individual or that um, assets may be with respective amounts 
or any others other other assets where you are holding that particular property as a steward for the benefit of so and so person for the benefit of so and so persons or the individuals now in this context whereby where you are managing the assets of any particular individual that is asset management companies asset owners asset manager com asset management companies amc companies is what we say asset managers or any service providers to these particular character to these particular people asset managers or asset owners where you are managing the assets or the properties of different individuals or you have pooled amount from different individuals where you are going to manage that particular fund the pension fund say for example asset management where you are going to manage that particular property for the benefit of some other people for the benefit of some other people in what manner you are going to manage this particular assets you being a steward what are the important principles that you have to keep uh, in mind when you are when you are managing this particular assets is what this uk stewardship code talks about where it says that stewardship is a responsible allocation you have been put up with certain responsibility for the management of that particular assets the management of that particular assets and the oversight of capital because whatever the amount that you pooled from different individuals you may end up in investment of some other company you are going to manage this particular assets you are going to allocate this particular amount into the equity into the equity so in what manner you are going to view or uh, you know create a particular value for that particular asset is what depends upon your principles so oversight of capital to create a long term value this is what i was saying create creation of a value create a long term value for whom for your clients and the beneficiaries for the ultimate beneficiaries leading to so it is not only giving any benefits to your stakeholder sorry to the beneficiaries only ultimately ultimately say for example i have pooled some 500 crores from different individuals and i am investing in some a company in a company now i am managing in that particular a company i am looking after that a company whether this a company is going within the particular provisions of the law or not whether this a company is having good corporate governance standards or not thereby it is not only giving benefit to the ultimate beneficiaries but also to the company to the company then to the to the respective society ultimately to the ultimate or uh, to the society and also to the economy because the company is going to do good because there was some constant monitoring on part of your asset managers clear everyone so it is not only with respect to your beneficiaries but also to the benefits of the economy to the environment and to the society why environment have come into picture sir here sir corporate governance is not only with respect to the governance of your respective laws sir first of all what do you mean by a corporate governance what do you mean by a corporate governance though we have discussed in our uh, comprehensive batch but let us understand again as to what do you mean by a corporate governance first of all what do you mean by a governance in a literal meaning leave about your uh, provisions of the law leave about your respective acts policies and all whatever it is first of all what do you mean by a governance in a literal meaning in a very layman language what do you mean by the governance simple let me take some micro example sir in your family in your family uh say for example your father is saying like this so wherever you go uh madam or sir wherever you go you have to be at home by 8 o'clock by 8 o'clock or your mother may say that uh, no non veg on so and so day you have to prepare like this or you need to follow this particular schedule or this is the way we need to behave ourselves 
Now, what's happening in all these particular cases? Sir, for your respective family, I repeat, for your respective family, there is a particular principle. There are certain particular principles that have been enunciated for your respective family where your family members shall adhere with that family or the, for that particular principles. I repeat, sir, for your respective family, be a father or mother, whoever it may be, they have promulgated with respect to certain principles which are applicable for your family and compulsory you have to adhere with that particular principles so that that will give you a benefit. That will give you a benefit. What benefit, sir? Say for example, your sibling is not following but you are following. That itself a very good benefit for you. Right? So, uh, so whatever the general principle that has been drawn in your family, where your family members are adhered to, sorry, compulsory to adhere with that particular principles, that is nothing but a governance for your respective family. Because your father or mother have come up with some set of principles, some set of guidelines, some set of policies as to Sir, in my family, all the family members shall adhere with this particular systems or the policies. Now, you cannot, your father will not say to the stranger or to the neighbor that, sir, you please follow this. You cannot say to your neighbor that, sir, you have to be home by 8 o'clock. What he will say? Who are you to ask me? Right? Right? So, whatever the policy that has been enunciated by your father for your respective family is nothing but a governance for your respective family. Right, everyone. That means there are some systems or policies or procedures that is being set out for that particular organization. Relevant term now. Organization. Wherein it is expected that the organization and the people of that organization comply with that particular systems or policies or procedures enunciated by such organization. Now, coming to the corporate governance now. Sir, governance with respect to your corporate. Sir, with respect to such particular company or a corporate, whatever the systems or policies or procedure has been set out, that has been set out to comply with that particular systems and policies so as to ensure there is a transparency. So as to ensure there is a transparency. So as to ensure that you are protecting the rights of your shareholders and stakeholders. This is nothing but a corporate governance. This is nothing but a corporate governance. And not only with respect to your compliance of the law, but also it extends with respect to having a responsibility towards your society and the environment. That is social responsibility. Sir, corporate governance is not only with respect to compliances of the law. Compliance of the procedures, compliance of the internal policies, it is further extended to the social responsibility too. Clear everyone? So, that is the reason where it talks about the environment too. Clear everyone? Then, the UK Stewardship Code 2020 is a substantial and ambitious revision to the 2012 edition of the code which takes effect from 1st January 2020. The code sets high stewardship standards for assets owners. We have said this, assets owners, assets managers, and for the service providers that support them. The code, compri sorry, the code comprises a set of apply and explain principles. Very, very important. Sir, we have understood the concept of comply or explain approach. Also, we discussed comply and explain approach. What was that? So, you comply a provision or if you don't comply, you explain me as to why you didn't comply. Say for example, section 135 before the amendment, the, the recent amendment. Say for example, if you don't comply, that is uh, with respect to spending of that stipulated amount of CSR expenditure, no penalty is going to be levied. You just mention in your board report as to what are the reasons why you didn't spend that stipulated amount of expenditure. So you comply, that means you spend that CSR amount or 
you explain me the reasons why you didn't comply so you comply with that or if at all you don't comply then you please explain me as to why you didn't comply with that provision so you spend that csr amount you report that in the csr annexure if you don't comply that means you didn't spend that amount then in the board report you mention the reasons as to why you didn't spend that amount that itself is a compliance but now there is the different case you comply with that if you don't comply you will transfer to the government fund or the second one comply and explain so you have to comply with that particular provision and also explain me as to how you complied with that provision i repeat so you comply with that provision i have complied with the csr applicability provision csr spending of the amount you explain me how you complied sir i have spent this amount towards so and so towards with respect to nutrition towards with respect to prevention with respect to health care with respect to sanitation so likewise i explained as to how i how complied with a certain provision so it may be earlier it was a comply or explain approach where there has been changed to comply and explain approach so what it says you apply that and also explain as to how you complied with that or if at all you didn't comply then you explain me what are the reasons why you didn't comply with that provision clear everyone so the code comprises a set of apply and explain principles for the asset managers and asset owners and a separate set with respect to service providers clear everyone so you have 12 principles with respect to asset owners and the manager managers and six specific rules again with respect to service providers which again is a repetitive of the earlier ones the code does not prescribe a single approach to effective stewardship instead it allows organizations to meet the expectations in a manner that is aligned with their own business model and a strategy sir there is no such thumb rule that sir this is a strategy that a company has to comply or adopt to effectuate your stewardship theory or stewardship rules or the duties so the code doesn't provide you or prescribe you as a single approach a single approach or a thumb rule that this is how you are going to effectuate your stewardship rules or duties rather it says uh, sir you please align whatever your whatever your objectives are there business objectives your goals you please align with your stewardship theory you please align these principles to the business objectives then that will be in a parallel manner where your economic development will be happening where you uh, comply with this particular principles at the same time your growth will also happen clear everyone where the code can the code consists of 12 principles for asset managers and asset owners and six principles for the service providers so the code has specified the following principles for the asset owners and the managers so what is that first one the purpose and governance so on the basis of purpose and governance five principles have been provided first one the signatory's purpose investment beliefs strategy and culture enable stewardship that creates a long term value for clients and beneficiaries leading to sustainable benefits for the economy the environment and the society this is what we have seen here this one so what it says signatory signatory is the one who is going to manage that assets the owners asset owners or asset managers who have pooled the amount who are going to manage the assets of that different individuals or who are going to invest in some companies in some investee companies sir i have pooled the amount from different individuals you being an asset manager you have been pulled an amount from different individuals now i'm talking on part of this signatory so what it says what is your purpose what is your purpose the investment belief if at all you are investing this amounts in any investee company then what is the purpose of that investment what is the belief that you have in such investee company i the strategy what you are following for such investment and the cultures that you follow the investment company follows the investee company follows whereby whereby 
by virtue of that act by virtue of that investment what you have made in the investee company where your cultures your investment decisions your strategy planning your purpose will all gives a value a long term value to the stakeholders to the beneficiaries not only to the beneficiaries also to the economy also to the society and also to the environment clear everyone that is first one second one signatories governance resources and incentives support stewardship so what it says sir within yourself what are the governance that you are following so as to effectuate the stewardship duties what are the resources and the incentives that you have so that you could effectuate you can implement this stewardship principles in the investment company and also in the investee company then signatories manage conflict of interest to put the best interest of clients and the beneficiaries first very important so say for example when i have pooled this amount from the different public and i am investing in a particular company and say for example on a future date there comes a transaction between this investment company and that investee company i repeat sir i have pooled different amounts from the public and the that amount have been invested in some investee company now say for example there is a transaction between me that is investment company and the investee company then there is a conflict of interest because i have made some investment where that amounts are belonging to certain individuals where i am managing that amounts now there comes a conflict of interest now how you are going to manage that conflict of interest how you are going to manage that conflict of interest where whatever the activity that you are going to do that shall be at the best interest and the benefit to the clients and the beneficiaries ultimate beneficiaries clear everyone next signatories identify and respond to the market wide and systematic risk to promote a well functioning financial system very important sir it is not only about the governance issues it is also identifying the risk identifying the risk what is the systematic risk systematic risk systematic risk mean beyond your control uncontrollable risk uncontrollable risk sir you cannot control this risk say for example covid 19 obviously it is beyond your control where all these institutional investors your asset management companies if at all not exactly the covid 19 but whatever the case it may be so we cannot of course we cannot you know identify that sir covid 19 is going to come of course we cannot but depending upon the market scenarios you may identify a risk you may identify a risk i what are the policies that the investment companies are having the asset management companies are having what are the mechanisms that you are having so as to identify the risk so that you can identify the risk whereby of course you may not eliminate the risk rather you may try to minimize the impact of risk in your investment company such that you provide a greater benefit to your clients and the beneficiaries so it is not about risk elimination which is not which may not be possible in the business scenario rather it is more about a risk minimization risk minimization minimizing the impact of that potential risk that may have on your organization clear everyone so whenever we take the concept of risk management it is not more it is not about risk elimination it is rather identifying and minimizing the impact of risk which is what the risk management is concerned about so you being this investment companies what are the mechanisms that you are having within yourself so as to identify so as to identify the risk potential risk which may be which are beyond your control and what are the mechanisms that you are having as to how you are going to respond to that particular risk now say for example now current scenario so the scenario when you take the, the about january or december 2019 and to the december 2020 the scenarios have been changed there are potential risk with respect to the continuity of the business some sort of business 
Now, how you are responding to that particular risk? What are the mechanisms that you are having? Is what matters there. And the last one, signatories shall review their policies, assure their process and assess the effectiveness or activities. Sir, once you have a policy of your stewardship, doesn't mean that that will survive the purpose for the long term because depending upon the changing scenarios, you need to review your policies and make changes accordingly so that you could provide a benefit to your beneficiaries. Clear everyone? So review your policies and assess from time to time on a periodic, periodical intervals such that, such that wherever the changes required with respect to your policies or the mechanisms, you could do so. Clear everyone? That is with respect to purpose and governance. Next, with respect to investment approach. Now, so you pool the amounts. Now you intend to invest in some companies. In some investee companies. Now, whenever you are investing, what are the investment approach? What shall be the approach and part of the investment company? Is what principle 6, 7 and 8 talks about. So, what it says, signatories shall take into account the client and beneficiary needs and communicate the activities and outcomes of their stewardship and investment to them. So, sir, in which companies you are making such investment? In which companies you are making such investment? And what is the requirement of your beneficiary? What is the need of your beneficiary? You need to create a framework for these two. So, depending upon your requirement and the needs of your beneficiaries, some may require a long-term value, some may require a short-term approach. So, depending upon the requirement of your clients and the beneficiaries, your approach shall be different, whereby your portfolio may be different, where the activities what you have considered, the outcome of that particular investment shall be disclosed to your respective clients and beneficiaries. Next one. Signatories systematically integrate a stewardship and the investment, including the material, environmental, social and governance issues and climate change to fulfill their responsibilities. Sir, it is not only with respect to finance oriented investment. It is not only with respect to return oriented investment. Why? Sir, corporate governance is not only dealing with respect to your EPS only. It is not only talks about your profit motive organizations. It not, it's not only uh, driven with respect to your market, with respect to your profit. Rather, it is much more beyond that. Rather, it is not talking about any monetary terms here. It is more about compliance of the law. It is more about your environmental. It is more about your sustainable development. It is more about social responsibility. So, it is not with respect to the how much profit that you are making. Rather, whenever you are making any investment in the investee companies, what are the factors that you are considering? Apart from your finance activity, the uh, finance regulations of these particular companies, or about the history of the EPS or the profit that is being made by the company, apart from these, what are the governance levels of the company? What are the compliance levels of the company? What is the history of the non-compliance of the companies? What are the history of penalties of the companies? Existing penalties, existing prosecutions over the company. Whether they are making any efforts towards the social development, sustainable development, apart from the economical development. So all these issues are to be considered. All these issues are to be checked out before you make an investment in the investing companies. So it is not only about your profit motive, rather you need to check out your social and economical guidelines, environmental guidelines, then you take a decision. Clear everyone? So that is what we say, ESG guidelines, right? Environmental, social and governance. Then the last principle res uh, with respect to investment approach that monitor, the signatory shall monitor And hold and hold to account the managers or the service providers. So when you are making any investment in these investing companies, you always monitor that investing companies. And you please, you know, integrate with that companies, engage with that companies, and constant monitoring shall be there on part of these investing companies. Then 
next head with respect to your engagement so with respect to engagement you have the three principles 9 10 and 11 that is more about engagement and the participation active participation uh, stakeholder participation is what we say so active participation of these asset managers with this investee companies so what it says signatories engage with the issuers that is investee companies to maintain or enhance the value of the assets and wherever necessary participate in the collaborative engagement to influence the issuers sir not only you with other asset managers you make a collaborative agreement you combine yourself as a single force and go with respect to a particular issuer for, for such that it could be a benefit to your beneficiaries and principle 11 signatories wherever necessary escalate what do you mean by escalate to increase to get up to increase the stewardship activities to influence the issuers to influence the issuers so whatever the factors that you are considering there Whatever the mean it may be, as far as it is relating to your stewardship activity with the intention of getting a benefit to your stakeholders, that could be a good one. Clear everyone. Then the last one, exercising the rights and responsibilities. So obviously, whenever you are making such investment, where you, you, are, you are having a major role to play because you are going to uh, end up making investment of some crores of amount. Say for example, an individual may invest, say for example, a 10 lakh or 1 lakh. But these institutional investors or these asset managers may end up investing 500,000 crores. So you are having a value over the, in that particular company. So you have to raise up your value, uh, voice whenever this company is going beyond a particular law or wherever you think that it could be now, this could be done in a better manner. Then you exercise your rights and responsibilities. So signatories actively exercise their rights and responsibilities clear everyone so these are the 12 principles that has been provided with respect to the asset managers and the asset owners and some separate set of principles has been provided with respect to service providers and again these principles remain same as what we have seen till now so we'll just have a look what it says the same thing Purpose, strategy and culture enable them to promote effective stewardship. And this is what we have seen here. Purpose, investment, belief and culture. Then, signatories, governance, workforce, resources and incentives enable them to promote effective stewardship. Again, this is the same point what we have seen. Then, identifying and managing the conflict of interest. The same concept once again. Because, see, this is with respect to specifically on part of service providers. And the earlier one, that is with respect to your asset managers and the asset owners. Signatories identify and respond to the market-wide and systematic risk. Systematic risk means, it is systematic, it is not systemic, systematic risk, that is uncontrollable risk. To promote a well-functioning financial system. Even here, you have to make this systematic risk, that is. Then, Signatory supports support clients' interrogation of stewardship and investment, taking into account material, environmental, social, and governance issues. ESG guidelines is what we have seen, and communicating what activities they have undertaken. This one, principle seven, and the last one: review their policies and assure their processes. Clear everyone. So this is the at the global level UK stewardship whereby the uk stewardship codes have been revised with the existing of 2012 edition their revision has been made 2020 jan 1 clear everyone An expected question for the december attempt clear everyone so can we move ahead the last topic that is the stewardship code for insurers in india so at the global level it has been amended so ultimately obviously this will be amended in the indian perspective too so 7th february 2020 where the regulatory authority of insurance that is irda has uh, revised the existing guidelines the stewardship uh, code for the insurers which was originally been implemented in 2017 or applicable from 2017-18 financial year so after almost three years or uh, yeah three financial years 
uh, in February 2020, they have revised the existing guidelines, existing principles for the institutional and the insurance companies. Clear everyone? So what is this? The insurance companies whereby uh, where you pay certain premiums to these insurance companies, where you take the life insurance or the general insurance, whatever the premiums that is being uh, collected by these insurance companies, obviously they're going to make some investment in some other investing companies. Otherwise, how they're going to pay you the amounts. So obviously they're going to make investments. Now, whenever you're making such investments, tell me whose amount is this support the public amount. So, Again, the stewardship role comes into picture because you are holding a property of someone else. So, whenever you are holding such amounts of some other people, in what manner you are going to hold this as a steward is what the principles what we are going to study now. Clear? So, IRDI uh, decided to review the existing guidelines, that is 2017 guidelines on stewardship code based on the experience in the implementation compliance by the insurers and the recent developments in this regard. Accordingly, a revised guidance on stewardship code has been prepared and placed herewith as a revised guidelines on a stewardship code for insurers in India. All the insurers need to review and update their existing stewardship policy based on the revised guidelines on stewardship code for insurers in India within three months from the date of issue of the same and updated stewardship policy need to be approved by the board of directors. Sir, on 7th February 2020, it has been released. So within three months, you need to update your stewardship policy and that policy has to be approved by your board of directors. And also you shall make up disclosures and wherever you have a website, you host that your stewardship policy. So what it says, the updated policy shall be disclosed on the website within 30 days with the approval of the board alongside the public disclosures. Clear everyone. So within three months of the release of these particular guidelines, you need to amend your existing stewardship policies and update with regard to the, uh, the new additions. And also you need to host that. Sorry, first of all, you update your stewardship policy in accordance with the uh, newly released one and get it approved by your board of directors then that has to be hosted on the website of the insurance companies clear everyone then any subsequent change or modification to the stewardship policy should be specifically disclosed at the time of updating the policy document on the website so what are the principles and the guidelines first one insurers insurers should formulate a policy on the discharge of their stewardship responsibilities and publicly disclose it. So the same principles again, some modifications have been provided, including the guidance part. So what it says, sir, you being in insurance companies, where you are going to invest in, invest in some industry companies, you shall have a clear policy as to how you are going to engage and implement your stewardship role and responsibility implement your uh, stewardship duties you shall have a clear cut policy and you please publicize that so what it says insurers should have a policy formulate a policy on discharge of their stewardship responsibilities and publicly disclose that so what it says stewardship activities includes monitoring and engaging with the companies on matters such as strategy performance risk capital structure and the corporate garments, including the culture and the remuneration. So, sir, in wherever the investing companies in which you are making some investment, where you are going to engage with that investing company with respect to the risk factors of the company, the strategy of that investing company, the culture of that respective company, the decision making and the strategy making of that investing company. So, all these particular things you are going to engage with that investing company, whereby you are going to discharge your stewardship responsibilities the policy should clearly define the stewardship responsibilities as identified by the insurer and how it intends to fulfill the same to enhance the wealth of its clients sir whatever you identified as your responsibilities you need to include in your policy at the same time how it will generate or how it will increase the wealth of your client you need to mention in your policy 
the policy should also disclose how the insurer applies the stewardship with the aim of enhancing and protecting the value for the ultimate beneficiary or the client so you please provide in your policy as to what are the different mechanisms or the policies that insurance companies will be taken into consideration for for creation of value of your beneficiaries by exercising the stewardship code i repeat sir you being an insurer here what are the different mechanisms that you are going to comply or implement with relation to the discharge of your stewardship role so that that will give a benefit to your respective beneficiary ultimate beneficiary insurers should have a clear policy on how they manage the conflict of interest conflict of interest in fulfilling their stewardship responsibilities and publicly disclose it sir what was the first one first one you shall have a policy you shall have a policy and you publicly disclose it second one you have a policy you shall have a policy with respect to what with respect to conflict of interest conflict of interest so what it says the insurer should put in place maintain and publicly disclose publicly disclose a policy for identifying and managing the conflict of interest with the aim of taking all the reasonable steps to put the interest of their client or a beneficiary first the policy should identify the scenarios of likely conflict of interest as envisaged by the board of directors i should also address how matters are handled when the interest of the clients or beneficiaries diverge from each other so i've discussed this in the earlier code to uk stewardship code sir whenever there is a conflict of interest how you being an insurance company institutional investors or asset managers or asset owners in the earlier case how you are going to manage that conflict of interest such that your clients or your ultimate beneficiaries are not at loss and wherever you are going to manage this conflict of interest that shall be at the best interest of your beneficiaries where beneficiaries shall be put first then to you clear everyone then third one insurers should monitor their investee company obviously very important one sir once you made an investment in that investee company obviously you need to monitor that investee company and un un unless you are not going to give any benefit to your beneficiaries so what is the third one monitor the investee company so what it says insurer should have a mechanisms or policies for the regular monitoring of the investee companies in respect of what the performance the leadership effectiveness the succession planning the corporate governance reporting and other parameters they consider important sir for each and every company there are different parameters so we cannot say that sir these are the parameters for all the companies for all the portfolios that you have no i cannot say that say for example simply if i have 50 lakh rupees with me and if i want to make investment in the securities market now if i look into the information technology company the parameters what what i look into will be different the food business and the hotel business the parameters what i look into is different yes or no because information technology the parameters what you link what you look into maybe with respect to your long term approach where everything may be into electronic form food business maybe as of now it may be low due to covid so likewise depending upon the market scenario and the facts and circumstances as on that particular date the parameters what you may look into the factors what you may look into for your investment will be different so depending upon your investment investee companies what are the different parameters that you are looking into what are the different mechanisms that you are having such that you are monitoring your investment investee company clear everyone then insurers may or may not wish to have more participation through nominations on the board for active involvement with the investee companies an insurer who may be willing to have nominations on the board of an investee company 
should indicate in its stewardship statement the willingness to do so and the mechanisms by which this could be done a nomination on the board of the investi company by the insurance companies yes you may provide such clause in your policy how you are going to implement that how you are going to nominate a director on the board of that investi company such that your interest of your beneficiaries may be hold good may be secured may be protected so in what manner what is your strategy what is your policy with respect to appointing a nominee on the board of directors of the investi company you please disclose that in your policy clear everyone then fourth one you shall have a clear policy on intervention in their investi companies intervention in the investi companies that means your engagement active participation in the investi company sir first of all here what you said it's only about here monitoring the investi company controlling the investi company here it is participating in the investi company how insurer should set out the circumstances in which they will actively intervene and regularly assess the outcomes of doing so sir how you are going to actively participate in that company by attending the meetings or by nominating a director or by performing by uh, making a performance evaluation on periodical intervals or based on the financials part based on the non financials part based on the leadership qualities based on the succession planning or what are your parameters what are your circumstances whereby you are going to engage yourself with that investi company irrespective of the amount of investment what you made very important irrespective of the amount what you have made investment in that investi company that is what it says in addition a low volume of investment a low volume of investment is not a reason for not intervening sir irrespective of your investment amount it's not about the equity investment here it's not about the amount of investment what you made it is about the intervention what you are making so that it could be a benefit not only to your stakeholders not only to your beneficiaries but to the stakeholders at a large and at the end to the economical development and the societal changes clear everyone so it is not about the amount of investment what you made rather how you are participating yourself so that that could reap a benefit to the ultimate stakeholders and the ultimate beneficiaries clear everyone instances where when insurers may want to intervene include but not limited to so it uh, this is a specific one so this may not be a perfect one the depending upon the investi companies that may change so do not limit your interventions only to these factors so what are those about the company strategies the performance the governance the remunerations approach to the risk the including those that may arise from the social or environmental matters these are some factors where you need to consider clear then insurer should have a clear policy for collaboration with other institutional investors where required to preserve the interest of policy holders ultimate investors which should be disclosed so so the four, fourth one we have discussed that what is that intervention intervention in investi companies next one is collaborations of whom the insurance companies so what it says you shall have a clear policy so for issues that require a larger engagement with the investi company insurers may choose to act collectively with the other institutional investors in order to safeguard the interest of their investors for such situations the insurer should have a policy to guide their actions and extent of engagement sometimes unity may be giving a benefit more benefits to your ultimate beneficiaries then you create an engagement with some other institutional investors or insurance companies where you are going to act collectively in that investi company where your voice may be increased clear everyone so if such is the case then what is your policy in engaging with that or in collaborating with that 
another institutional investors so you have a policy for that too clear see if at all you observe all these things dealing with respect to policies only so you have a policy in that policy you mention as to how you are going to monitor how you are going to intervene in this university companies how you are going to manage the conflict of interest how you are going to collaborate with other institutional investors is what it talks about then insurers should have a clear policy on voting and disclosure of voting activity so it talks about the voting part see why why voting is required sir say for example you have invested some amount in a company in a reliance company so say for example i have invested in a reliance company i am residing in hyderabad now say for example i am holding one share only one share for example and there is an extraordinary general meeting tomorrow for whatever the purpose it may be and i have received a notice as i being a member now to vote that particular share to vote that particular uh, vote it is the right to vote on part of me i want to go to uh, the respective place say for example bombay to exercise my vote with respect to one share practically is it happening no thereby what has come e voting procedure have come still e voting process yes it is giving some benefits but not to the extent all shareholders are may, not, may or may not participate in that voting but when you talk about these institutional investors these insurance companies where they have invested a huge amount of investment in that companies in that investee companies where you are representing so many people where you are managing the amounts of different individuals where it is expected from you to vote to exercise your voting rights in such investee company and whereby whereby so simply you say you please go and vote insurance companies may not come up and whereby by by these particular courts so by these principles ird has mandated which certain slab rates are provided certain amounts of uh, asset under management depending upon the assets under management and the amount of investment what you have made they are mandated with respect to voting we'll discuss that so what it says insurers should not just blindly support the board of directors of the in- board of the investee company but instead take their own voting decisions to promote the overall growth of the investee companies and in turn enhance the value of their investors so simply uh if at all you are holding any shares and you get the ballot paper simply i assent 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 and you give the assent for all the resolutions within no matter of time but but you being a shareholder see i'm not talking about the institutional investor now as a shareholder have your own decision making for whatever the item of business that is been provided there do not think that it is it benefit for the company or not do not think whether it is benefit only for the board of directors or the respective individual think whether it is benefit for the company think whether it is benefit to the shareholders whether it is creating a value to the company whether it is giving any addition to the environmental or social development so all these factors need to be considered then give your vote be it assent or a dissent clear everyone so insurers should not just blindly support the board rather take their own decision making to promote the overall growth of the investee companies whereby it enhances the value of their investors the voting policy should be publicly disclosed the voting decision taken in respect of the investee companies should also be disclosed publicly along with the rational for such decision then insurer should disclose the use made if any of the proxy voting or the other advisory services so if at all you have taken any services from the advisory people advisory services you have taken then you publicly disclose that that they should describe the scope of such services that is advisory services identify the providers and disclose the extent to which they follow rely upon or use the recommendations made by such services see we have these advisory services firms whereby they provide they read these investor companies investment investee companies they make a study of these investee companies they make a study of progress of these investee companies and provide 
as to whether you can continue your investment in this investing company or not with respect to your uh, agenda items that is with respect to voting items they provide an advice whether you could uh, go against it or you could go assent of that particular resolution so they provide the advisory services so if it all you are availing such advisory services then you publicly disclose that then insurers should mandatorily very important uh, provision undertake active participation and also voting on resolutions or proposals of the investee companies under the following circumstances size of the aum aum means assets under management assets under management of the insurer in crores and read the lines here compulsory voting required compulsory voting required when if the issue insurers holding of the paid up capital of the investee company is 3% and above and 5% and above listen here we talking about the insurers holding in the investee company so depending upon the holding of that insurers in that investee company in relation to its assets under management value it is providing the mandatory voting so what it says sir if at all your insurers aum value is up to 250000 crores then and if your stake is 3% and above in that investee company then mandatorily you shall vote mandatorily you shall vote if at all if at all your aum value is more than 250000 crores about 250000 crores and your investment is 5% and above then mandatory voting is required not understood what it says see there there is an insurance company right there is an insurance company where aum value aum value is up to 250000 crores or above 250000 crores this is one criteria this is with respect to aum criteria the other criteria is with respect to your holding of the paid up capital of the investee company so what it says sir if at all your aum value is up to 250000 crores and and if at all your investment if at all your investment is exceeding 3% of paid up capital of investee company of investee company i repeat if at all you being an insurer company insurance company where your aum value is up to 2.2.5 2 lakh crore and you are holding more than or equal to 3% of paid up capital of the investee company that means in the shareholders list of the investee company you are a shareholder holding more than 3% then compulsory you need to vote compulsory you need to vote that means what is the con what is the contrary to that sir your aum value is up to 2.5 lakh crore but you are not holding 3% say for example you are holding 2.5% then it is not mandatory it is not mandatory so two things sir your aum value is up to 2.5 lakh crore and you are holding more than 3% each 3 or more than 3% of the paid capital of the investee company then mandatorily you need to exercise your voting rights same way sir your aum value is about 2.5 lakh crore and the checklist is with respect to 5% if at all you are holding more than 5% if at all you are holding 5% and above of the paid up capital of the investee company then compulsory you need to exercise your voting rights otherwise not clear everyone so two things you need to check out my dear friends here one is about your aum value that is up to 2.5 lakh crore 
then check out whether you are holding more than 3%, 3 or more than 3% or less than 3%. If at all you are holding less than 3%, it is not mandatory to vote. But if at all you are holding 3% or more than 3%, compulsory, these institutional investors or the insurers shall vote. Same way, if your AM value is above 2.5 crore, then you need to check out your uh, investment value, the percentage that is 5% and above or less than 5%. If it is less than 5%, it is not mandatory. If it is more than or equal to 5%, then you need to mandatory register that. Clear everyone. And the last one, insurers should report periodically on their stewardship activity, periodical reporting. So, where are we? This one, yes. Sixth one is with respect to voting. And the last one that is reporting. So, what it says, in addition to the regular fulfillment of the stewardship activities, Institutional investors should also provide a periodical report to whom, to obviously to the ultimate beneficiaries as to how they have discharged their responsibilities in a format which is easy to understand. However, it may be clarified that the compliance with the aforesaid principle does not constitute as an invitation to manage the affairs of the company or preclude a decision to sell or holding when this is considered in the best interest of the clients or beneficiaries, very, very important. Sir, please understand what he is talking about. It is clarified that compliance with the aforesaid principle does not constitute an invitation to what? Invitation to manage the affairs of the company. So the principles has been provided to the insurance, insurance companies or the institutional investors to actively participate in the investee companies for the benefit of the beneficiaries but not with respect to controlling that investee companies. The target of these principles is not to control or manage the affairs of the investee companies or preclude a decision to sell the holding when this is considered in the best interest of the clients. So you don't have any right to sell off undertaking of investee company. Clear everyone. So what is the intention of this principles? Sir, you being a steward, where you are holding an amount of different individuals or public, in what manner you are going to manage these funds at the best interest of your ultimate beneficiaries is what the target of this particular stewardship rules or principles. Clear everyone, but not with respect to managing the affairs of the investing companies clear so this is the stewardship principles with respect to insurers in india clear everyone and these are the amendments that are applicable for the december 2020 attempt as far as grmc considered concerned sorry clear everyone any doubts any doubts sir with respect to the examination point of view the focus shall be much upon the part 2, part 3, part 1 and part 4 as already discussed in the classes, in the physical, in the comprehensive batches what we had. Clear everyone? So part 2, part 3, only of 3 chapters that you have, uh, but it's almost, almost 40 mark. So at least you need to get 30 plus, then surely you are, you are able to get that 60 plus in this particular subject. Clear everyone? So these are... The amendments which has come up, which are applicable for the December attempt. Clear everyone. So if at all you have if at all you have any doubts, you can call to these particular numbers or you can visit the website for the books or the classes, whatever the case may be. Clear? Or you can also have a mail ID over there in the website too, or even the description to the link. You'll be having that mail ID too. So you can call me, you can text me and please do clear your respective doubts. Clear everyone. So all the very best for your examination. Please complete all these uh, amendments too. You can get this PDF copy. I've just condensed the matter here. Just give a call. You can get this part. No issues with that. Clear everyone. All the very best for your examination. Please take care. Bye-bye.